right, everybody, and welcome to episode 254 of the Nine Years Podcast with myself, Nick Draper, and the face of the BBC Sport website, Mr. Stuart Deacons. And um, we drew with Rochdale on Tuesday night, and we're staying up. Season's over. Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back in August. I am, of course, joking, but Stu, I don't know what to talk about now, because we've done it. 97th minute equaliser, Joe Piggott, three or draws, Rochdale, six points clear. Don't talk to me about goal difference swings and def- two defeats and two wins for Rochdale. Don't talk to me about that, because it's not going to happen. We're staying up. And that is the season over, this horrendous season. It's just been the worst season. It's been the worst season for many reasons, but chiefly because we haven't seen a minute of live football in person, in front of stadiums, in front of crowds. And it's very difficult to follow things really as closely as perhaps you would do normally. And there are so many instances over the past month or so, or two months, where people have gone to me, oh, wouldn't that have been great if we'd have been there? Can you imagine what it would have been like if we'd been there? And I was like, yeah, I, c- I can imagine, but we weren't. Um, it sucks. So I'm just glad to see the back of this season. And now that we're finally safe and ready to go into League One next season, I can just relax and kind of pretend football doesn't exist now until August. Surely. Well, yeah, you say that. We've got the Euros. The Euros 2020. Yeah. Which we don't know where they're going to be. I think it's just, I think basically the game's going to be played anywhere. It's safe, which at the moment is here. Um, even though we're still locked down, which yeah. is the irony of it um, on that side. But you know, I know what you mean. Yeah, I listened, um, the Watchtower game, I actually listened to the away commentary um, because I found them quite amusing. They were proper, it was like, you know, like Mikey T and Robert, uh, they were like two fans. Um, and I listened to the obviously the penalty save and, and stuff like that. And literally, when Joe Piggott's equaliser went in on ninety plus seven, their reaction told me all I needed to know about well if we were safe or not because they were deflated. They I think they sensed they had to win to give them a serious chance. And you know, the way I look at it, you know, you know, sometimes you say a penalty save can sometimes it will give the lift to the team that's had the penalty save. Well, equally, we scored in the last minute, and that's going to really rattle. It's going to really rattle Rochdale, and it's probably going to stay with them uh, on on Saturday. So they've got to lift themselves, um, and they've got. To, hey, look, if you said now, what position would you rather have, Wimbledon or Rochdale? We all know what we'd say. We'd all know what we'd be saying if we were in Rochdale's position and they were in ours. Currently, we'd be all like we're down. It, yep. You just you. It's an irretrievable situation in on, in your mind, anyway. And of course, no, it's not mathematically impossible. There is still a chance. There is still a chance, but yeah, let's live in the real world. I mean, to be fair though, just you, I'm not sure we are living in the real world at the moment. Um, the world's gone absolutely mental. Radio rental, whatever that Cockney Ryan slang is. Um, Tuesday night, once again, Stu, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I couldn't watch the game. Too busy, too much work to do. Don't get me started on the podcast about the current situation inside schools. It's a fuck up. So I didn't see the game. I saw the reactions to it. There was an interesting post on WAP I saw. When I do venture onto WAP, and it's only because I just don't really have time to, to go on there. I saw an interesting post talking about um, the doomsday scenario being painted by people during the Rochdale game. And there was a lot of that. I, did, I was keeping an eye on social media and obviously on my phone getting messages about what was happening. And it was like losing to Rochdale was... The end of the world. Everything was on fire. Everyone was super depressed. And it just felt to me a little bit hyperbolic. And that's why I always feel like I thought we'd equalise. I was 100% confident. I messaged people. I was like, don't worry, we will equalise. We're not losing this game. I had one of those feelings that I had. Funny enough, most famously, I think, away to Rochdale a couple of years ago when I said we'd win 4-3 with a last-minute penalty. Just one of those feelings. I didn't see it happen. I, I wonder about the psychology of people in these moments. It's almost as if they want things to be as bad as they can possibly be, to paint as bleak a picture as it can possibly be. So I don't know. To somehow, I don't know what it is. Is it like a need to try and convince people, convince themselves that everything is absolutely the worst it's ever been, because because it means that they get themselves more invested in matches. I don't know. I don't know what it is to. I don't know. It's like a drug, isn't it? Football's like a drug. Um, and I'm rambling here, and I realise this is one of those um, long, rambling trains of thought that uh, Ishiguro will talk about. But it's like... Uh, it's like the drug of the last-minute goal. 
And when you're live and in person and your team scores and injury time equalizer, injury time winner, and that fantastic moment where you all go mad. And we had it so many times down the years. I remember going back to Ryan Premier League with Braintree Town at home and we got a 96 minute equalizer from Steve Butler. And you want to recreate those moments. You go to football for these moments. You don't go to football for all bloody talking about bloody final third entries and why your fullback is tucking into centre midfield or your overlapping centre half. You're not, you're not going to football for that. No one goes to football for that. They go for the moments of emotion and raw passion. And I wonder sometimes, you get to a certain point when you've been watching football for so many years, it's hard to keep that up. It's hard to keep that feeling because you've seen it and been there so many times before. So is there a little bit of people that is making things out worse than they actually are? Because then when they hope that when the moment comes and we get a lot of equaliser, the elation is so much greater and they get to get that drug of celebrating and having that emotion that you get from... Yeah, yeah I, see come, I see where you're coming from because ultimately we've all been locked down or we've we're restricted to what we can do. So at the moment, football's giving us that drug, isn't it? And maybe, yeah, we do want that. We want that real high, don't we? Um, but equally, we get that real low when we can see goals. Um, yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really weird, it's a really weird season, isn't it? Um, you know, I think, I think for me, I think, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm holding the tooth and I've seen many comebacks and, and stuff like that. And yeah, they're great, but they're only great if you're there, if I'm being honest with you, I think. You need that because we all celebrate with each other, don't we? You know, I'm, I'm celebrating with my cats at the moment when they're in here and they're looking at me. My wife's hitting me because I made her jump because she can't see what's going on. I've got my headphones in. Um, so that's the only atmosphere I'm getting and I'm getting more bruises than I'm, than I'm getting rid of at the moment. But um, I think, you know, at the ground is is where we'd all join out together. I, I think for me next season, it's going to be a factor. It's going to be a plow lane um, to share that. Um, like I can't help but every time I look at that ground, I'm envious of anybody that's there. I'm envious of the players being playing on the pitch. You know, it's just it's it's un- it's it's unfair now. It's you know because it's there, it's there, but we can't get in there. Um, and I, I'm counting down the games simply to get to the test event. I'm looking forward to going to a test event of an under twenty three game, just for the fact that I can sense that this is coming to an end and um, you may get to see some football. Yeah, and things might go back to normal. Next season, who do you reckon first home game at Plough Lane? Because I've got an out... I reckon it's going to be... Do you know who I reckon it's going to be? Go on. Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah. We, we always say, don't we, if, you, if you're going to get a team... First game of the season, what you don't want is you don't want a team that's just got through the playoffs or on a run. Um, and you want a team that's been used to losing. Um, so, to be fair, Wickham... Yeah, when you look at the Championship, Wickham have hardly... Compare budgets to Wickham, Sheffield Wednesday, Rotherham. Wickham are only like within, what, three points of Sheffield Wednesday? They shouldn't be anywhere near. You know, Is they, that not... That's also Sheffield Wednesday points deduction, didn't they? That's true. I forgot about that. So, yeah. but, but that's still... because they cheated the rules, didn't they? Yeah. Um, but we could have done really well. Um, but of course, you know, when they come back down to our place, it, they'll be falling over. But at least they'll be falling over on a carpet. So that'd be nice for them. But yeah, Sheffield Wednesday uh, or Rotherham. Um, the, the good thing is, I, I, I said to you before, didn't I? I just didn't, didn't want to return to Plough Lane as a League Two club. I'd have felt cheated. Um, you know, League One, left League One at Kings Meadow on a, on a sunny afternoon in March against Bolton. And then return in August playing Sutton United or Morecambe. Uh, that had been hard to take uh, on that side. I'll tell you what I did, um, going to site of topic, topic, Cheltenham Town got promoted into League One uh, on the week. I felt for them. I felt for them. They were celebrating amongst themselves. That should be, um, you know, Cheltenham are not going to get too many promotions. And they were all on their own. And I don't know if you saw, but they run out into a car park where there were Cheltenham fans that were on the fences. And they had a singer song, sing a song, sing a song. Sorry, um, and I it made, made me laugh. It's just let them in the stadium. Just let them in the stadium. Enjoy it. They're, they're all you could probably socially distance them in the stadium. They're not socially distancing now. Um, so it was really that. And then the flip side of that is Grimsby getting relegated. Uh, XR long trip midweek, and they had nobody. Just trudged off the pit. Mm. Um, maybe that's sometimes better but you know sometimes when you get relegated like we have well you know back in the day at Southampton you share it amongst you know the players get some support off the, the fans don't they 
To be fair, I was surprised that Cheltenham got promoted because I, I hadn't felt they were really at the races all season. But I think it's fair to say that they would celebrate with their fans trying to jump over a fence. And I suppose they've probably got a whip to use for the, um, for the pub, haven't they? I'd imagine so. They had a whip round for them. Uh, maybe a whip round for Grimsby, although there's something a bit fishy about that relegation. But that's uh, another topic for another day. Rochdale then. Well, actually, no, before we get on to that one, because there was one comment, Stu, that was sent to us by one supporter who shall remain nameless. And I will not name that person this week. <laughs> um, who said, I said, look, we're staying up. We're safe. It's done. It's over. Don't worry. And they were like, can't say that. This is us you're talking about. Remember, this is Wimbledon you're talking about. I'm thinking, we have been successful come the end of the season for the past 14 years without fail. When we've gone in to the final games of the season with something to play for, we've always come out smelling like roses. Playoff final victory against Staines. Then we got the late equaliser to gain promotion from the Conference South at Hampton Richmond. We got to the playoffs. We won the conference playoffs at the first time of asking. We stayed up on the last day of the season against Fleetwood. We won the League Two playoffs at the first time of asking. We stayed up the following season. We didn't have any play for it come the end of the season. But then every season since then, come the end of the season, Doncaster away one season, wasn't it, under Neil Lively? We yeah. had the great escape under Wally Downs. We always stay up at the crux of it. So, yeah, can we can we lose the cliches that every football fan thinks that this is, of course, it's us, we're always going to mess it up. No, actually, like I said, it's your little guardian angel that sits on our shoulder keeps us going and uh, things happen for us at this time of season. We always come out smelling like roses. So why? We, no reason to be worried. No reason to be worried. But anyway, um, never give up. John Cena says it a lot and proved again it's Rochdale. Is, is our run, obviously Mark Robinson and all the changes he's instigated, but how much is it Palmer, Asal, Rodoni and Piggott? Yeah, I, don't, I think there's been a... Uh, it's easy to look at the final, the final third, isn't it, in terms of where it's all, all happened. But you have to look at Ben Hennigan, Ben Hennigan come, come back, Ben Hennigan coming back, uh, Zanev, him, you know, had Zanev coming from nowhere. Will Nightingale looking like a defender? He wasn't, you know, Will complained it too. Um, George Thompson. I think, John, I think there's lots of elements into it. Yes, Piggott will get the he- you know, headlines for the goals. Uh, Sal has been amazing, uh, no doubt about that. Um, but I don't think you go on the run we've gone on without the whole team doing, you know, you can't carry many players um, on that side. And we, and, you know, the reason we're staying up is because of our forms in Accrington, in terms of, you know, being Accrington, beating Oxford, beating Ipswich, um, beating North Ham- sorry, beating Swindon, smashing them outside, wasn't it? So that's, that's where the hard work has been done. But um, Palmer, Palmer coming back in has made a difference, no doubt about that. Um, and of course, he he started on on Tuesday when it looked like he was out for the rest of the season. So, um, some big perform, but yeah, it's been some big performances. Uh, and I think it's you know I think it's really difficult to pick a man and match at the moment. Um, I I thought Nestor Guinness Walker was excellent uh, on Tuesday. It really did. I thought it was excellent from fullback. <clears throat> and I didn't necessarily think Jack Rodoni was was great. If I'm being honest with you, because I think he just it's very difficult for a kid sometimes to keep that level of performance. And whilst Jack Rodoni wasn't poor, he didn't have that edge. And with Jack, you want that edge uh, in the final in the final third. Asal impressed me with the with Rodoni's goal in the week with his strength. Yeah, wasn't nudged off the ball. wasn't wasn't going to ever be nudged off the ball. And then he puts the cross in, and um, yeah, very impressed with him. We've we've already spoken on this podcast about what battle we face in, in keeping hold of him. I imagine that is going to be an issue. I think there's one of the questions we'll come on to later, actually, about who might stay and who might go at the end of the season. But I think you've referenced Hennigan and Dobson there, and they form a very solid spine in the middle. And I think that might be tricky if we can't um, secure them for next season. But... Yeah, and, and do you know what? With Asal, he's he's been, you know, like I say, he's a he's a danger. He's whereas you think Piggott would be the one that would be doubled up on Asal is a lot of time and Asal, do you know what, he didn't he struggled um, he struggled against it which a little bit uh, Oxford doubled up on him um, but the cross the cross is such a good cross because it's flat as you like um, he's whipped it in you know in terms of the, the pace on the ball so really all Jack's got to do is get in there and, and really connect it but when you look at the goal it's interesting because Rodoni as soon as Asal gets that ball 
would only head straight into that six yard area. You know, knew where he was going to put it. Um, but and I think that's how I had a, an, an average evening. But the problem is now, I think, I think we're all expecting him now to do wonders. It's amazing a seventeen year old. And actually, weird enough, we now want him to have the ball because he looks the most exciting player on the pitch. Um, and it's just a shame, like I say, next season. Um, no, I, I, it's interesting. I was, um, Oddie Palmer was on uh, Warmers Had a Dream podcast the other week. And Oddie said something that I said at the beginning of the season that some players might struggle with crowds um, because of that expectation. I'm not saying a sale will, but it will open up some different dynamics next season. Who was it? Was it Josh Parker? Sorry, this isn't a comment on a sale. I just remembered it for some reason. Um, Josh Parker at Cambridge away. Sorry, that memory just came to me randomly when he got the ball. I'm just thinking of a sound next season. What happened is in my head, I was thinking of a sound next season with a crowd behind him, picking up the ball in a deep position and running forward and running at defenders and taking them on and what have you. And then I just remember Josh Parker away at Cambridge who did exactly that, except he just kept running and kept running, kept running and then ran out of pitch. He literally just dribbled the. He literally just dribbled the ball straight off the pitch. I was like, what? You, oh, and then he went on to play at League One anyway with Gillingham, didn't he? Um, yeah. Slightly changed. Slightly changed his role. Who was the former Luton? Um, Calvin Andrew. He was another one. Rochdale, wasn't he? Last season or the season before, centre yeah, forward that became a centre half. Where's he gone now? He scored on the week. He scored on the really? weekend. Oldham is he at somewhere? Not too sure. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. He must be about forty-eight. Rochdale. Yeah, he's so old, but, you know, anyway, I wonder what happened to Enoch Shawnee. Anyway, I'm getting off the point. Uh, Ollie Palmer, OP are his initials, and they were the first two letters that came out on Countdown today. Uh, I just happened to go, oh, look, it's Ollie Palmer. And then the uh, the twat, who's the winner at the moment, came in wearing a fucking Watford training top today. I was like, fuck off. Like, I'm, not, I'm not putting up with this shit. I went into a music lesson today. They're playing Elton John. I'm like, fucking, what's going on? Like, Classic. Oh, my good God. Wanted to throw things at him, the teacher. We should we should play that at Plough Lane. I'm still standing. No, no, let's not. Only, do you know what? I'll accept it when we host Wickham, but under no other circumstances will I accept <laughs> that song being played. Um, what else happened on Rochdale on Tuesday night is um, we're all very positive we stayed up, but um, defensive defending set pieces. All of a sudden, we turned to absolute shit, and they were. Three of the worst goals. <laughs> to be fair, our equaliser was also pretty poor. It was a good like the, the, the deliveries. No, I'm not even going to say the deliveries were all good in this goal because Rochdale's first goal. Oh my god! <laughs> but at least the deliveries were good for us. And Oli Palmer, there was, the goalkeeper, lost out in, in a battle and wasn't strong enough, and we got a tap in. But oh my good god, the goals we conceded to you! My word. Yeah. They got worse, didn't they? <laughs> they got, you know, the first. I look, Joe. You know I look back at them because I just, I when you're watching a game, you you get caught up in it. They look bad. So, but I looked back the other day, and the first one, um, George Dobson does an air kick. Joe Piggott thinks Dobson's going to kick it, and then he doesn't, and he don't react, and then it literally every just goes along the, along the goal line, doesn't it? It's an interesting um, point. Sorry, I just want to point out because I was meant to say this before. You say about the fact that Joe Pickett didn't react, which I, I was going to pick up on. Remember, we've said in the past how our players seem to be quite passive and they tend to watch things happen as opposed to actually actively get involved. And Rodoni's goal was, as you mentioned earlier, was him, Sal gets on the ball and Rodoni's reacting and he's getting into a position straight try away. Try away. Yeah. And that's the difference, isn't it, that Mark Robinson has brought in. So when we've conceded these goals, that's what's quite surprising because actually you could probably say, in a couple of instances, there are players such as Joe Pete you mentioned there who just haven't reacted. Do you know what's, in, you know what's interesting? Because I know Robbo would always say, you know, we're, we're Wimbledon, but we're not the old long ball Wimbledon. But if you look to when we scored that goal, we had three, we had three people in the six yard area hmm. um, waiting for a cross. And then to remember the days when we used to have Holdsworth, Gale, Robbie Earl, all, all in the six yard area. And then you split the centre half, so, you know, you've got a spare man. Um, and we do that, we make some really good runs. If you look at It'd be interesting if you could see a video now of comparison between us under Glynn, and that's no that's no reflection on Glynn, and us under Rob. The amount of people we get in a box now compared to what we used to. A lot of runs, a lot of sacrifices, and they're not always getting the you know, they're not always getting on the end of it. Um, but we get players in a box. But yeah, in terms of goals, the second one is just second one, the guy just runs in from the edge of the area. I think he just runs and keeps running. Um and you always know it's a bad goal when the goalkeeper even does, doesn't even dive or just doesn't. It's just yeah. It, I don't know. I don't know where we were picking up. 
the, the worst thing about that goal was that <laughs> the only player that challenged him for the header was his teammate. And he was yeah. like, no, I'm getting out of the way. But obviously the player who scored that goal uh, on loan from Luton, I just have to say. Oh, really? Um, yeah, he's a, a loser cool. loney. But um, the third goal, do you know what? Oh, the third goal oh. is the flick on, isn't it? The far post, and he heads it in. Third one's terrible. Just they're all, bad. Well, <laughs> they're all bad. Well, yeah, but I think the third one to me, the third one is the worst because in one, when it is, you know, you've just equalised, you've just got yourself back into the game. Switch on. We 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 should be going for the win, and I think we could have won that um, if we hadn't seen the third goal. But it's also about what jobs people are doing because we we do a bit of a mixture between zonal um, and man marking, but. The one who scores a goal, he's actually trying to block the keeper off. And we've got nobody around him to stop. So, one, we're, we're, bang, we're gambling that Sanev's going to be strong enough. He probably is. You've got someone on the, on the near stick. But that the player who scores a goal comes away from Zanev and he's literally free in the area. So, either Zanev should be calling that because we didn't need a person on the post. So, sometimes I think it felt to me we, you know, Robbo alluded to it, that we just didn't um, adapt. We didn't. We had set things to do, but people had set responsibilities if things changed. And we didn't. But the third goal for me was the worst goal. Um, because there's no... How do you get a free header from six yards? Is it a slight complacency? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Um, maybe nerves. It was a big game. You know, Rochdale... I thought Rochdale... Do you know what? I thought Rochdale were decent. Um, it's the first team I've seen get through our press... So, you know, we, we hunt in numbers, don't we? But <laughs> Lawrence Lowndes swinging a clipboard at them as they're trying to get to the pitch. Like. <laughs> but no, you know, the, the way to beat a press is to pass quickly and, and, and play through the lines. Because if you've got, we sometimes hunt in four or fives. If you do that, then if you get through the, if you get through the press, you're normally two on two, three on three. Uh, and Rochdale have done that continuously. And what I noticed was that we then weren't as hungry in the press what I mean by that, you know, when you, you constantly win, it's a Swindon, couldn't, couldn't get their own off. And we pressed and we pressed and we pressed because we knew we could gamble and they wouldn't get through us. In the end, we were a bit hesitant and we didn't press as, as good as we have. And I think our strongest part of our game at the moment is, is the high press and winning the ball back cheaply. Um, so Rochdale did well in that. But Rochdale's Achilles Hills is they can see goals. Yeah, far too many, and that's why they will be returning after quite a few years now, actually, in the yeah. third tier, going back into to League Two. But um, hey, oh well, sucks to be them. Who was it? Scott Hogan. Was he Rochdale? Went on to Brentford. Oh, yeah, it was. He had a hat trick, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, hat trick against us, yeah. He did, yeah. Great couple of great goals in there. So so I'm just going down memory lane here for no reason whatsoever. Um, on Saturday, we play Portsmouth. We'll win. And that'll be fine. So I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, who's in charge? <laughs> Danny Cowley now at Portsmouth. Is yeah, Cowley. Trying to get them out of the league. So um, let's just have a quick look at the table, actually, whilst they're there. Because, so, Joe, I can't really... I can't... It's like I say, I'm finding it hard to keep up with things. I'm just so busy. I'm kind of thinking that Hull and Peterborough have confirmed themselves promoted. So um, you're starting to see a little trickle down all through the pyramid, or at least the professional leagues, of hierarchies and like Hull and Peterborough recent hold back up at the first attempt. Yeah. Peterborough traditionally in the championship and Premier League this year, I think championship Norwich, Watford, probably Bournemouth is going to go straight back up through the playoffs. It's all much of a, it's very, very familiar. Uh, needs a bit of a shake up along the way somewhere. So Portsmouth currently sixth in a bit of a scrap for that final playoff place. <laughs> I think everyone else should be fine. Blackpool have got an extra game left as have Lincoln. Uh, Charlton have got a game in hand though actually saying that so it's a, it's a real royal rumble for the playoffs but Hull and Peterborough are up and um, it's really between it's really where the Rochdale can win their two games to give them any hope and hope that Wigan fail to win either of their games and that way Rochdale well, Wigan, will stay up Wigan finish at Swindon don't they um, so that just depends whether Swindon have got a team together still then um, and whether they can be bothered but Wigan probably got a decent finish in the game um, but yeah, do you know what? I think the playoffs, the playoffs look exciting uh, in terms of teams in it. Um, and we also have to remember that crowds will be back for the playoffs. Mm. So that is going to be a really weird thing, isn't it? It's like the recent crowds at the finals of the, the Carabao Cup and stuff, isn't it? Um, but yeah, fans will be back for the playoffs, um, which I think will make it even... Hey, look, a game with fans is always exciting, isn't it? So... Um, I'm looking forward to the playoffs. Um, and I was looking, just for a topic, I was looking the other day in the National League because I was watching, um, I was watching Sunday United play Eastley. 
um, on the weekend. And I didn't realise, but because obviously they suspended the season, uh, they finish at the end of May. Yeah, they got, yeah. So, it's ridiculous um, how much they still yeah, want to play. And they're going to possibly have crowds um, at games as well. I think Sutton have got Hartlepool, which could be like a real battle at the top. And that's more than likely going to have fans in there. So, um, yeah, mm. should be interesting. Will be indeed. I saw the League Cup final, by the way. Um, it, well, it was on. I wasn't following it particularly closely. But Spurs, why are Spurs not in white? What is going on? Furious <laughs> about this. You get to a cup final... You don't clash. Your colours don't clash and you change anyway. Absolute nonsense. Absolute bullshit. Um, right. Questions on Twitter. You put the you put the request out earlier today on Thursday. And um, do you want to explain what you did and what happened? Yeah, basically, I just didn't think we'd have a script for tonight. Well, we don't. Um, it's clearly it's don't. obvious we don't have a script, Stu. Clearly. You know when we don't have a script because I start meandering and talking absolute <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> so I thought it'd be good just for anyone that's got any questions, topics... You know, we've got two games to go. Um, what do people uh, want to know? Um, or that side of it. So I think we had quite a healthy... Did, um, did anyone ask us who invented the skip? No. Nah. Disappointed. Oh, well, never mind. Um, well, how far do we go back on our Twitter mentions? Let's have a look. So I think, yeah, I think I, I don't know, about two-ish, I think, from memory. Oh, um, what's this? Is that, what's this from Mike Overall at Mike underscore Overall? Bit late <laughs> listening to this one, but Stu raving about Piggott doesn't have a problem with penalties anymore. So it's your fault. Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't expect him to get two penalties in a week, and so I missed them both. <laughs> oh, it's so difficult to have a goal a go against Joe Piggott, isn't it? But he shouldn't be near a penalty. Um, he shouldn't be near a penalty. Well, We've got penalty takers in there. Like, what was the penalty he scored the other day? Well, he scored one penalty the other day. Yeah, I know. and he just what, he made it look so simple, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But he's the problem with Joe is that he, he opens his body up, and I reckon you know what Sky Sports where they do that um, graphic, don't they, of um, where he's where they scored oh, right, and where yeah. they haven't scored. Oh, lay money. Most of his saves have been down the middle, or when he opens his body up to go to the keeper's left. Um, telegraphs it. I was literally shouting at my screen, blast the well, blast the ball. That was my um, advice. Or give it to Joe, or give it to Tony Palmer, who was apparently taken at, at Crawley. Um, but yeah, but fair play to Joe. Yeah, fair play to Joe. He, he stayed around. Um, what no choice? He was playing football, um, and he got the the late equaliser. So yeah, he's not getting a haircut, is he? Probably, yeah, he's got, he's got to sort it out. Isn't he? I know I can't. I know I can't moan about haircuts. I'm not moaning. I'm just I'm just merely observing because I old. couldn't wait to get my hair cut when it was after lockdown and. Um, but he seems to be growing it out, so maybe he's going for like a, a Triple H look. He's going to grow it out like the game and start he look, spinning he looks water old. when he comes out to the pitch. He looks old, so I know he's out of contract. It's like he's retiring at the end of the season. Ouch. He looks old. That's a soundbite. Right. We might have to we might have to put some like watermark that point of audio in case people start putting it out. Nine years podcast, <laughs> breaking <laughs> news. Joe Pickett to retire. Um yeah, well, hopefully not. Um, I don't think so. He's going to Watford, apparently. That was the latest news. So, um, oh, yeah, don't, don't do it, Joe. Don't do it. Um, my word, Watford's one of the worst places in the world. It's up there with Newport as one of the worst ones. Um, right. When we start, this is from Callum McGarry at McGeary. I'm going to say that's how that's pronounced. When we start Luke O'Neill, the opposition tend to attack our right back position with relative success. Do you think these defensive frailties are outwi- outweighed by the decent crossing he can deliver in our attacks? Yes, <laughs> is my answer. Best crosser yeah. of the ball at the club. Best crosser of the ball at the club. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. I think, I think what we there's been a few games I think we started when he wasn't properly fit. Um, and they did overload it on that side. But I think you play O'Neill all day long, and that's nothing against Chad Alexander. I think Chad Alexander's a very good uh, fullback. But when you've got so many people in the box and delivery of Luke O'Neill, you've got to have him in. I think what we've done a lot more now um, in recent games is our two holding players in Dobson and Woodyard. It's their job, really, to try and get back in and, and double up. You'll see, you'll see a Sal do that as well work really hard to get behind the ball and give him protection. Um, but I think, in my opinion, you, you have to play him. If you, if you want to win games, you have to play him. If you're going away from home and you want to go for a draw, you play Jerry Alexander um, for that side of it. But 
Uh, Luke O'Neill was the best, as we said. It's the best cross of the ball. Um, you know, I know we can say the goalkeeper mucked up for the second goal uh, on Tuesday night, but he just puts it in areas. He puts it in areas that makes keeper make a decision or, you know, favours the attacking team. Womble Motivation, we alluded to this earlier, at Womble... Well, it's at Womble Motivation, but just without the A in motivation. So uh, I assume someone had already had the original handle. How many of this side will be here next year? Will pigs stay? Let's go through this one by one, Stu, because um, for all you uh, Year 7 students of mine listening, of which there aren't any, but anyway, uh, this is a good example of repetition and rhetorical questions. Well, not rhetorical questions. They're actual questions. Uh, will, will pigs stay? Um, I've got, I, think, I think we've got more of a chance than we did a general keeping them. Rodoni, will Rodoni be here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he will be. Uh, next season, certainly, yeah. It's, it's too early for him to be going anywhere at the moment. I'm trying to think back to the old days of Wimbledon FC, we'd have a young player come through and be like, oh, he'll move on. And they yep. always seem to stay a little bit longer than we, we thought they would. Um, trying to think, who, yeah. who would be the best? Like, like Jason Yule stayed for, for Chris Perry's, long, really. Neil Sullivan's, Jason Yule's, Carl Cole. Yeah. Look at, look at the fees we got for them. Um Peter Hawkins. Do you know what? I always think it's like a, we're, sometimes. I can't believe like you didn't. Fine... I can't believe you didn't flinch at Peter Peter Hawkins. Hawkins. Oh, bless him! Like Bruce Forsyth, wasn't he? Uh, good game, good game. Um, yeah, do you know what? it's like a fine wine at Wimbledon, wasn't it? It was like you know, the, the longer we kept it, the better the wine become, and the more stronger it come, and the better transfer fee we got. Oh, so it's like a fine wine, and in all seriousness, we've got to start doing that at, at Wimbledon. As, and then now, you know. Jack Rodoni, um, Asal, Will Nightingale. To, yeah, to, to, we've got to make sure that they they give the not the service, but you know we bring them through the academy. We give them that first team football, they experience football, and they know we go for more money. You know, it's like um, sorry, Darren McCanty kept saying, you know, like he sells when he knows it's the right time, when he can maximise the club get the most money, and also the player gets the best deal. Um, and we've got to be like that. There's no doubt we're going to get bids in the summer because clubs of championship clubs that know we we need money. You'll, you'll see a lot of championship clubs testing testing the resolve of a lot of League One or League Two clubs because they'll they will think they can get players on the cheap. No different for us, but we've got to, you know we've got to resist it because a sale another season will probably be worth double treble what he's worth now. Will Cox be pushing Zanev for the number one position? He means so. Matt Cox, not um, penises. <laughs> hope so. Hope so. Um, he's still young. Still very yeah, young. A, yeah, he is. I think. I think the thing is, I think it's we've got more chance now of a goalkeeper playing from the academy through than we ever have because Robbo would do that journey. Um, my gut thing is, uh, Coxie would go out on loan for the first part of the season. Uh, and then come back and beat, uh, beat with Zenith. Why are we obsessed with the euphemisms in this country? It's like when we had Neil Ardley and Neil Cox and people were just like, oh, we've got Ardcox. And it's like, why? <laughs> why? why? When, who, what was our back four? What, what, who did we used to have playing for us along the back line? We had Bush and um, people like that, and we all found it hilarious. Like, we're so juvenile. Do I, do I tell you a story about uh, Matt Cox um, with, when Thomas was ball boy? No. So I said, this is hilarious, right? So I gave, so he was in a change room um, and he was nicking, he was nicking Nathan Trott's um, ball. Hey, Nathan Cox. Trott was on the floor. Yeah, no, my, my son Thomas. <laughs> um, he had some sort of bouncy ball that he was, and he kept nicking it and throwing it. Nathan Trott thought it was hilarious. Um, but they go round and get all brass of the players in the programme. Thomas went straight to Matt Cox and Matt, nice. Matt Cox went, oh, no, no, I'm, you, you don't want my brass, I'm not playing. And it was interesting because when I didn't, I'll be truthful, I didn't really know, I knew the face, but I didn't know who he was. And Trev, after, said to me, he said, we will want that old graph um, mm-hmm. in a couple of years. Um, so my, my son's obviously a very good, um, a very good scout and he should be in the, in the recruitment thing that we've got set up because obviously he can spot a start. And a goal scoring, and a goal scoring star as well in that. Quite clearly, he went for Quezia Pye's um, signature as well, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, Quezia injured himself picking up the pen. <laughs> Um, will we try and make Dobson permanent or bring in 
Hartigan. We had this conversation a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, about the differences in players and uh, yeah. is Hartigan that sort of player? Um, and I think if Hartigan comes back in, I think we we change our setup a little bit to accommodate. Is that fair? Yeah, do you know what? Hartigan will be back because one, anyone who's been in Newport can't wait to get back over that, that seven bridge at Bristol. Um, so he would definitely be back because Robbo will, yeah, Robbo knows what he can do. I, you know, we must, we've got to try this, and I'm sure we are to keep Dobson because, what is he, 23, 24? Um, not for the fact of how good he is. If we can get his signature on a contract, we've got potentially a very good set of asset there. And I know you shouldn't talk it like that, but it, it is. If we can convince Dobson to decide he, he wants to play closer to home, if he's not enjoying football under Robbo, then I don't know when he is. We've got a good chance of keeping Dobson, but it's not a, it's not a shoe in. It's probably a 60 to 40 I reckon, in our favour, depending on Sunderland, um, of how much do they do Sunderland want to write him off um, or do they want to, want to fake? Last one, and just maybe a, a one word answer to this one. Will we try and bring other loanies back, Longman, Johnson, etc.? cetera? Um, maybe not a one word answer, but a very short answer. I wonder if said players will be looking to go out on loan next season, maybe a, a step up like we see in the past, maybe a team challenging for promotion from this league or a team already in the championship? Um, without Donald Johnson's out of contract um, from Leicester, okay. I would I would be amazed if we don't try and get him. Um, hell of a problem. Hell of a problem if we have him, Hannigan and Will Nightingale and Vian and Tira Thomas. Got a mm. lot of setbacks. Mm. Mm. Not a lot of room for them all. Uh, uh, Russell at Slough underscore Womble. If results don't go favourably on Saturday, we could be dependent on a certain club up the M1 doing us a favour, question mark. Yes, we could. Um, let's, not, let's not discuss that possibility. They would never be able to do us a favour, whatever they, whatever they do, um, because they are scum. Um, Stuart Larkman, Stuart underscore Larkman. Do we play for a point or go for it? We all know what... Uh, do you know what? We just play our normal game. We just we just play it. We we forget about being in a relegation battle or what position we're in the table or what the points are. We just go and attack the game as if it's a one-off game, uh, as you would anyway, uh, as you would Agree. normally. Um, Agree. All the other stuff is um is background noise really. Uh, Gary Fletcher, take me through your reactions to the equaliser Tuesday. On a personal note, I totally lost it. Well, Gary at Gaz Fletcher AFCW. As we were talking earlier, I was in a different position to most, and when I saw that we had scored. Um, I just had a, I gave it, I had a, a knowing smile because I knew it was coming. Um, I knew we'd do it. So, um, I, yeah, that was my reaction. Stu, you, um, from what you were saying earlier, you just started attacking your wife by the sounds of it. <laughs> well, no, 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 look, yeah, penalty miss, I was really paid off. I was more paid off with pigs for, for, for trying to side for it. Um, and for the equaliser, yeah, I did celebrate, but I'm very much similar to you, actually. I, I thought we'd have one more chance. I thought we'd have one more chance. And this team doesn't know when it's beat. It's, it's you know, look at it. If you look at the amount of late goals we've got, ridiculous. Um, so we've got, a, you know, Robbo does chance his arm. I was confident we'd get another chance. I can't, I can't go mad in an empty room. Like, that's the problem. <laughs> like, <laughs> what I mean by that I'm is... Say, Stu, if you're going to go mad, I'd say that's probably one of the most likely way it's going to happen. Like, Well, as long as it's, as long as it's a padded room. But, like, I think I find it difficult to go mad, mad on my own with I follow, uh, with headphones, because I want to be there. Do you know what I mean? It's, it didn't surprise me um, that we got the equaliser, but I enjoyed it. But if I was there, I probably would have smashed my knee up on the seat in front of me um, or been running. Actually, no, I won't have a seat in front of me because I'll be on, on a disabled thing. I'll probably be running the whole length of that disabled platform. Which reminds me, never leave early, people. Never, ever leave a game. No, I hear some people that turned it off as well. Turned the iPhone off. Well, <laughs> to be fair, but... nothing, nothing to do with the football. <laughs> I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, Nathan Jones at Nate Brems. Nathan Jones, of course, uh, helped The Undertaker to one of his wins at WrestleMania back in uh, WrestleMania 19. So uh, there you go. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the same Nathan Jones. What gets the heart and stress going more, promotion or playoff push? Or down to the wire relegation battle. Well, we've had it all in a short space of time. 
with AFC Wimbledon. Uh, the stress going more. I think it's true. I think the most stressed. That's a good point. I've, no, I've never felt stressed in a relegation battle. No. You know what? No, that's a lie. The most stressed I can remember being at any point over the last 20 years, since Southampton away, because that was... Brad, Bradford was worse for the stress. Bradford was actually a worse day than the Southampton one. But um, that was, since then, the most stressed I've been is when we played Bradford in um, the season we stayed up on the last day, with Neil Ardley's first season where he kept us up on the last day against Fleetwood. And the most stressed was we had Bradford at home and we'd lost at Chesterfield the week before. And I was thinking this is, I thought this was, this was us down. And I, was, I had one of those feelings that we'd beat Bradford 2-1 in a similar feeling I had when we, we lost to Derby 4-0 in the Premier League. And that was the worst thing ever. And then the next week we turned it around and beat Leicester 2-1. And I just had a feeling it was that same sort of scenario and Chesterfield and Derby not a million miles apart either. And I thought, but then Bradford were winning very late into the game. <laughs> um, and my world was crumbling around me. And I was thinking, oh, my, my feeling is it was useless. It's of no use. And that's when I got the most probably stressed and worried about relegation. And then obviously we... Um, we turned it around. Gary Alexander got an injury time winner that day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, I'd say relegation battle maybe, just at a push. See, you know what? Relegation, I, I think the most two stressful periods I had were playoffs, playoff finals, Luton, City of Manchester Stadium. Um, and the... Oh, Luton uh, didn't see Stu because I was just going to support the winner. So I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't give a shit. And the Plymouth, the Plymouth game, I think the reason I was stressed is because the playoffs are so exciting when you're not in them. Yeah, but you know, Luton, Luton, we that was a big chance. Like that was one of those that you know, conference is so difficult to get out of, isn't it? It was like it's a great opportunity, and it's a one game. And then Plymouth, because again, it's like we shouldn't have been in League One. We shouldn't have been. We shouldn't have been anywhere near League One, but we had a chance. So I think that's the stress I get because it's a, it's a, it's basically a cup final at the end of a long season, and no one wants to leave Wembley or to see Manchester Stadium as a loser. I hate Manchester City, by the way. Sorry. Just another side. side. Absolutely hate them. <laughs> um, that's it for our questions. Thank you very much for sending them in, all of you that did so. And uh, Stu, we are pretty much out of time, I think. So um, pretty cool. much time to, to wrap up. And um, we'll be back next week. Obviously, we'll be back on Sunday on the YouTube show. But that's pretty much it. Season done. Safe, happy days all over. And uh, three-day weekend. Oh, my good God, do I need a three-day weekend? Yeah, we are oh, closer to a test event. And then the games in the summer, the Euro Champions. Can I just say something about a whinge? I want to finish on a whinge. Have you seen the prices of the England <laughs> kit this season? Can I just say one thing, Stu? I've, yep. In my life, I've very often finished on a whinge. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> I was going to buy the England. So I was going to get my son his first England kit. So Euro Champions, you know, Euro 2020. A year ago, it was a bit late at the top. You know what I mean? But 69 quid. 69? 69.99 for my stop. I mean, the kids were... I just sat there and thought, we're all mugs. We're all mugs. We moan about the, the club taking the mick out of us and the FA are doing it and then it's it's robbery. It's like, it's absolute robbery. It might as well have had a gun to my head. Um, I call it a bad analysis, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, 69 quid. I ain't paying that. I'm sorry. I'll wait until we get knocked out and it'll be cheaper. Yeah, I can't add anything to that. Do you know, Stu, I remember Euro, Euro 2004, the kit we wore there, they launched it, and um, I think it was like 40 quid at the time. But um, numpties in Debenhams were going, if you can find this top cheaper anywhere else, we'll match the price. Debenhams is across the street from Blooming Sports Direct. <laughs> Sports Direct is selling them for like a fiver. But that's where I went in. That's where I went in, because I went out with my son for uh, just to go shopping, and because like, the shops have not been open. It was so nice to be able to go into a shop. Yes. Um, and I really like the blue, the blue England tops. Lovely. I'm like, I'll get that. And then I looked and I want you to have that. I like, get that. Yeah, there are, but at every level, we've had this before, Stu. Do you know what started it all off rep, with the replica kit things is when they changed it to say it's not a change kit, it's a home and away kit. And they, yeah, all that nonsense. No need, for, no need for three kits. No need for them. You only need two. Anyway. Maybe we should get a new kit for like, should we have a new kit for next season? Because we like, already are, aren't we? We're getting one behind closed doors. We should make. We should get another kit. Uh, another one, a well, Champions we've away, League kit. We've got but... a weight kit coming out, haven't we? So the green kit goes. Um, so we've do, got you know, do you know what else clubs do? And this is a bit of a, a sly one as well. What they do is 
back in the day when squad numbers were first invented, Premier League then brought out their own special font that every club had to use, which is fine. Um, and you'd use that for every single game you played. But then clubs conned on and realised, well, they can create their own fonts, which means they can have a different font for the back of their shirts, whether they're playing in the Champions League or if they're playing in the League Cup or the FA Cup, and then the Premier League one has to have the standard Premier League one. So now you've got all the other revenue streams of kids going, oh, actually, I want a, a Raheem Sterling shirt, but I want it for a, with the Man City. It's like, oh, my God, it's just a constant con all the time. Yeah, and I'm going to have that battle with my son, obviously, big Wimbledon fan um, already. <laughs> So I'm gonna have that. I'm gonna have that problem with it. He had a big say in that decision, didn't he? He's he's do you know what? He's so he wakes up in the morning. And I tell him that we've won, and he the smile on his face. He's probably passing me, but um, in all seriousness, I can't. Do you know what? I can't wait for him to to go to a game. As I say, he's a year, a year. Obviously, his age is is a long time. Um, so I can't wait for him to be able to you know go to a game and. Yeah, it should be fun. And it'd be, with, it'd be with the wife because I'd be looking at football she can look after it. And on that note, <laughs> the listeners can't see what I can see. Um, <laughs> we'll say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us this week, listeners. Thank you, Stu, for joining me. Thank you. We will be back next Friday. Um, Alexa Bliss, bag first, milk last two, plus two equals four. Speak to you again soon.